America's favorite new musical is Six. Six is the winner of two Tony Awards and voted Best New Musical on Broadway World and Broadway.com. The New York Times proclaims Six totally rules. And Entertainment Weekly calls Six Broadway's euphoric celebration. For tickets, visit Six on Broadway.com. Back to a Celtic state of mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined for the first time by John Hughes because you and I haven't shared a screen. I was going to say a stage, not not yet. <laughs> We've certainly not shared a screen on the Axon Bulletin yet. How are you doing, John? I'm very well, mate. Very well. I'm sure we're both going to miss Kev's rather unique take on things today. And sure, no one can match the man for an analogy. So, uh, you know, I, I always no. remember. You know, the Viz used to release these wee books and it was just all the different uh, wording, etc., that they used and phrases and explanations thereof. And I'm just waiting for the Kevin Graham version of uh, his analogies. But maybe one of these days he'll be able to explain them to us. Kev is otherwise engaged. Axom does have a team of contributors, uh, often referred to, in fact, John, as the Axom cult which is fine. I'm sure that's what they called us. I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're ever evolving. So, you know, yesterday on a Tuesday, you often see Natasha. Natasha's in Germany. So obviously we have a pool or a, or, or a cult pool of players um, who can come in. Uh, so tonight I'll be joined by Kevin uh, McCluskey for the game. Really looking forward to that. And if he's fit, he has got a, a late uh, match fitness test. Colin Watt will also be joining me. He had to sit out on Monday because he was ill. But that's just the way it goes. That's the way it goes. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm having to uh, make preparations for next week. I'm flying over for the game uh, next week. Uh, and uh, I have all sorts of preparations to make for that. I've got all this gear to take with me. And I have, my, you know usually stay with my brother, but his Wi-Fi is unbelievably bad, so I've got to move houses, you know, uh, and get it all. And you talk about a late fitness test. I, I I hope to be dying on Wednesday, next Wednesday, after the celebrations, but, you know, I hope uh, so we'll as well. see how we go. <laughs> I hope so as well, absolutely. As always, we're keen to hear your thoughts. We're going to be talking, obviously, about tonight's game. Uh, I noticed in the comment section, I do read them in the comment section on the YouTube channel, someone was getting stuck for their pronunciation of tonight's opponents so I have gone as far to consulting YouTube and YouTube has told me that it's Leipzig, that's the way that you pronounce it, I don't know if someone's been calling it Leipzig, I'm not sure uh, but we are playing them tonight John um, <laughs> it's also today, a hundred years ago, Jockstein was born and uh, we're going to have a wee dig about that as well, we're going to have a wee talk about Celtic's youth the whole policy, the chat around Ben Doak and others, a golden generation perhaps lost. There's a whole podcast in that where we're touching on some of the players who will be missing tonight and how big their emissions are going to be as well, John, because I think that's a big focus. I mean, just generally speaking, I was listening yesterday with interest, Big Lawrence talking about tonight's game, what we have to take from it. Um, I guess when I was looking at, at these fixtures, I thought, right, I'm writing off Real Madrid. I'm writing off both those games, right? And then I thought if we can take something in our, our way encounters against Shakhtar and Leipzig, I'll be happy. But then you've got to win both home games. And that, that was kind of my view when we came in. And if we come away with that, I think I'd be delighted. We actually might not get through on eight points, but I would be delighted with that as Angie's first taste of Champions League group football. What's your take on it? Uh, I think we need to take a point tonight, uh, realistically. Uh, there's no guarantee of winning the, the two home games. Um, but I think, we, you know, if we need to take, if we take a point tonight, it really knocks the wind out of Leipzig. Uh, so, you know, they will, 
they'll be struggling to get through from that point on. So, um, you know, it's a must-win game for them. It's a must-take-a-point game for me. Um, so uh, it, it puts them under pressure and it opens up, uh, you know, it makes it more interesting in, in as much as not that they're a team that would ever sit back, but they have to come at us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... You know, I, I know this has been covered up their forum and also, but I mean, I, I was looking back at their their three games um, since uh, Rosa has taken over. So obviously, they they beat Dortmund three mm-hmm. nil. Uh, they lost three nil to Munchen Gladbach, and they won four against uh, Bochum. Bochum, you can just uh, dismiss that because that's like us bumping Dundee United. They're bottom of the table and they're dreadful. Uh, so the only two games you have to go on is Munchen Gladbach and Dortmund. The Dortmund game was his first game in. He is the former Dortmund manager. He immediately changed the formation to um, basically play against Dortmund. So he set it up to stop all ball progression coming from their centre-halves uh, and their uh, defensive midfield players. Uh, and that worked a treat for them. Now, Dortmund have been sketchy anyway, uh, form-wise, but they were at the top of the table at that point, Mm -hmm. uh, performance-wise, should I say. Um, But it's very, very difficult to take anything from that. What I would say is they've had a really poor season so far by their standards. Um, Yes, there's a new manager in, but this is not, you know, Ange, the new manager, uh, he hasn't had a transfer window and he's probably not, even when there is a transfer window, it doesn't look like they're going to give him any money anyway. Mm. They seem to think that this squad should be good enough. And they're right on paper. On paper, they're a tremendous squad. So what we need to be uh, concerned about tonight, who's going to turn up? Are they going to be the paper tigers? Are they going to be the bulls? So, you know, we need to be wary of that. And, uh, you know, as everyone has mentioned, on paper, uh, they are obviously, a, 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 you know, to me, a better side than us. But the thing about it is, it doesn't count for anything. You know, it just mm-hmm. doesn't count for anything when you're. I, I would say we are both in a sort of similar place at the moment. Um, so I'm very anxious about this game. I have to say, mm. uh, very anxious. I, I'm not. You know, I'm excited for it, but I'm far more anxious than I'm excited. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just feel that. With us, the way that we are playing as well, you know, we're in what I call should have form, you know. So the negatives of should have is what well, we should have buried Shakhtar, we should have beaten St Mirren, eh, we should have buried Motherwell, we should have taken our chances, we should have been faster in transition with more yeah. pace and more purpose in passing, eh, we should have better concentration, we should have played for 90 minutes. Now, the upside of should have is could have, we could have done all those things. Mm-hmm. which means that we have the ability to do those things, you know. So it's not like uh, we, we are outmatched completely here as we have been in the past. We are not. Uh, I, I, we are on a par with these, at least in my view. Yes, on a bad day they could do some damage, but we could absolutely pummel them on a bad day for them as well. So yeah. uh, and this is the point. Who's going to turn up today? I really don't know. And that includes us. Who's going to turn up? Uh, is Celtic going to turn up tonight? I don't know. No, you're right. And, no. and if they do, then you can see someone like Yota in full flight. Um, the, the, some of the players who are in there are, I guess, not first picks for Ange Postacoglu. We'll get to some of them. Another should have, could have, Maeda opening the scoring against Real Madrid. McGregor's strike from distance, which you know could have ricocheted into the back of the net. So I totally get what you mean. And that's where the frustration creeps in, John, because mm-hmm. when you come away from these games, you're thinking to yourself, we could have had something better from each of the games that you've actually mentioned. They should have won against St Mirren. I'm not buying into the fact that the wheels have come off. Absolutely not. I, I, I still think it's a blip. There's a few comments I'm going to bring up here who would um, agree with that as well. Uh, Jungle Line, regular contributor. Always a pleasure to see you coming in on the YouTube. Tough gig tonight. Hopefully a win. Take a draw. But the league is more important. Talking of gigs, we just posted um, a picture of Prince playing at Celtic Park in 1992, John. Uh, I wasn't at that gig. Um, Shakespeare's sister supported him. um, And there were at least one Celtic fan in their ranks um, yeah. uh, but I was at the U2 gig a, a year later but looking at that period we had Brian Adams playing at Celtic Park as well and by the way we also had Cliff Richard 
playing at Celtic Park. I'm going to dig the photos out and put them up. Do you think that was something around about that time? I am digressing, John. Apologies in advance. When it comes to Celtic, I sometimes go down some wee uh, rabbit holes. <laughs> w- was that the, the likes of Terry Cassidy, etc., trying to find other streams of income at Celtic at that time? It seems to be a glut of concerts at Celtic Park. Well, clearly it was. Clearly it was. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, you know, if you followed Celtic in the 90s, those were some of the best things that happened to Celtic Park <laughs> during that entire decade, because mm-hmm. uh, the rest of it was pretty grim. Uh, so, no, uh, we were trying everything, you know, because we were, you know, we couldn't, it's basically the, the shoes on the other foot now. Uh, we couldn't compete. Mm-hmm. With uh, Rangers uh, and their, uh, their their financial dealings, uh, and we weren't really aware of that at that point of you know where that was going to lead. Uh, we, we were just a step behind. We were always a step behind, and uh, it just you know I I I, I mean I hated the nineties for that reason. You know, I, and you know he's talking about Andy Gorham broke our hearts and we should have won this game and we should have won that game, but those are the those are the games, and you know we've had this against sides that were better before. Uh, they were a better side than us for the most part, and therefore you're clinging on to wee chances and missed, you know, missed opportunities and all the rest of it. And you're like, oh, what if we did it? You know, mm-hmm. no, you know, we just um, for the most part we weren't good enough, and of course we were doing everything we could to try and raise money to try and you know to combat that. But hey, you know what? All worked out in the end. <laughs> it, it did. It did. <laughs> I always look back at that period as well, John, and I think about, yeah, I know after the centenary year, Rangers gave us two hammerings, 4-1 and 5-1. But if you look at the 90s, that period uh, in the doldrums, in terms of hammerings, we always turned up. I think except yeah. one one time when they beat us 4-2 and they, they went into a 3-0 lead after like 20 minutes or something like that. But we always turned up. We always gave them a game. And, you know, yeah, sometimes the win that Celtic got was the final game of the season when the league was gone. But it's not as if they pulverised us like we were for season upon season uh-huh. pulverising Rangers recently. Yeah, you've just uh, you've just brought back a terrible flashback there. I, I think that 4-1 game, uh, was that the game that McAvenny scored first? Uh, yes, yes, yes. And I think he broke his arm that well, day. We got tickets for that game, myself and my brother. Uh, Barry Ferguson was playing football with my stepbrother at that time. Uh, and we got tickets from Derek Ferguson. We were in the Rangers stand. And I'm entirely convinced he told everyone before we got there who we were. Uh, because, oh my God, it, it was brutal. The looks we were getting, it was absolutely desperate. Uh, so we, we bolted at half time because it was, you know, McAvenny scores first and you're doing that thing where it's like, oh, oh that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then, uh, you know, from, from there on in, we were getting absolutely pummeled. So we bolted at half time. Oh, I don't blame me. I think there's probably a podcast in. Um, Axon contributors being in the away end. Uh, I know that JP certainly has got quite a few experiences of that as well. And you've just got that instant reaction uh, to Celtic scoring a goal. So you're Sorry, taking Paul, your... One, one second, I have... Uh, my computer's not plugged in properly. There no go. problem. I will, I will run no, with that's it. it. That's, that's it. That's <laughs> fine. Human um, error, as always. No problem at all. We will... We will uh, proceed. Jungle Line, just before you go, Jungle Line, are the Irish pubs back open in Liverpool? Well, the reason I bring that up is um, we did see some tricolours. We've seen some uh, Celtic flags at Anfield last night. And, um, you know, when I look at Liverpool, uh, there's been a couple of really interesting episodes on Axom, if I don't say so myself, over the last few years, one of which... Back in the days before the world turned into um, video experts and everybody started streamyarding and zooming and all that kind of stuff, uh, there was a great uh, audio podcast with Professor Phil Scraton, um, who obviously was at the head of the um, team who uh, ran through the evidence uh, or some of the evidence that had been missing from the, the previous inquiries and it prompted a, a, a public inquiry into the Hillsborough disaster and I had a great interview, a great chat with Phil 
um, about this relationship Celtic have with Liverpool. And obviously it goes back, uh, it didn't start off too well back in 66 uh, down at Anfield where um, I've got an image, I'm going to put this up on the socials as well, where they picked up all the bottles that had been strewn onto the pitch after Celtic had been beaten 2-0. And yes, John, you're absolutely right. If you're going to say this, Bobby Lennox scored that night and it was a mile onside <laughs> and it was chopped off. Celtic should have gone through and away goals. But one of those bottles struck a ball boy and he was actually in a coma. And then, of course, that was the semi-final of the European Cup Winners' Cup 1966. It was the second European Cup Winners' Cup semi-final that your late father played in, which is astonishing. They had made it in 1964, MTK Budapest. So our relationship with Liverpool didn't get off to the best start. The wee ball boy recovered, John, and when Liverpool came up to Glasgow to play the final against... Borussia Dortmund, whose ex-manager is going to be managing our opponents tonight. Uh, the Celtic fans waited for them at the train stations to embrace them um, and obviously to, to say sorry for the, the young kid who had been struck. Our relationship with Liverpool has built from there. Do you have any affinity to the club, John? Or are you one of these guys like myself? I do. I, I've got to say I do. But if Liverpool, unless they're playing Rangers, if Liverpool get beat, I, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it because I'm a Celtic fan. I don't care about English football. I, I just say, you know, I, I, I couldn't care less. I, you know, I'm a Celtic fan and uh, I don't have other clubs um, unless you're talking about St. Rocks or, you know, something like that. Or, uh, so, you know, I, I don't have uh, secondary clubs. Uh, now, Liverpool, now, you know, to my mind, it was always, especially with Steven Gerrard being in charge, mm. uh, there now appears to have been a, a complete uh, turnabout then. Uh, just because of, of what happened over, um, you know, the, the 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 forced warning and all so on, so on. So essentially, they appear to have objected to that the same as we did. So you had the very very odd situation last night of a uh, a Scottish club singing the English national anthem to English fans and being booed for it. Um, so you know that that was pretty bizarre. Mm. Um, now, to be fair, you know, I had to be told about that because I say, uh, you know, and again, I, I I don't watch games involving Rangers. I have a friend of mine who I refer to as the Rangers Scout, and he fills me in because uh, I just I, I can't do that. I can't tolerate it, I, I, you know. So, um, and again, in terms of affinity for them, yeah, it seems to have it turned about now. I think that there's been they, they might have realised, you know, and again on a social level, yeah. uh, a social justice level. Uh, we are uh, far more in line with the values I think they like to think that they have. Um, so, you know, uh, again, that was different when Stephen Gerrard was there because, you know, his presence alone seemed to make it difficult for them to support us. So, uh, yeah, no, look, you know, fair play. I mean, well, the, the Hillsborough thing as well uh, was absolutely just desperately terrible thing to happen. Uh, so they've always had my sympathy um, I, I've never disliked him as a club, um, you know, but I, I don't care. You know, I, English football as well, I just don't like it. I don't like the money that's in it. I don't like the big fake bubble mm. built up by Sky. And, you know, myself and Kev spoke about this a, a few weeks ago, about just the, the, the complete inequity in the game. Uh, and, you know, that bubble in England is part of it. it, it just... Um, it, it, it gets me uh, fair annoyed when you look at teams that are getting relegated uh, from the English Premiership, taking a hundred million down with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, so uh, you know, look, we we are. Uh, I, I'm concerned with how we can combat that. Uh, that's my concern. You know, that stupid money. Listen up, let me tell you a story. America's favorite new musical is Six. Six is the winner of two Tony Awards and voted Best New Musical on Broadway World and Broadway.com. The New York Times proclaims Six totally rules. And Entertainment Weekly calls Six Broadway's euphoric celebration. For tickets, visit Six on Broadway.com. How do we combat that? We can't combat it at the, at the very top level, but... You know, I think Ange has shown, shown, and Michael Nicholson has shown this year, uh, and the, the backroom team, that with very, very astute, uh, you know, scouting and mm -hmm. very, very 
wide knowledge of the world game as opposed to just the the the, the, the blinkers on for certain countries um, that we can potentially compete. Now, this is just this is our first rung here, you know, uh, in this competition this year. Um, you know, but as I said, also to Kev, we we don't have a lot of time to get it right because this team will be picked apart. So, you know, we, we really need to start getting it right uh, before we lose all our most valuable assets in the summer. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean that that is a concern. I'm, I'm going to come back to it because I'm going to pitch something uh, to yourself, John, and to those in the comment section about how the game has changed and if there is another way to approach that. Is there another way to make inroads uh, when you're not in that bubble of English football or in the top half dozen leagues where I've seen a picture on social media and it looked like a wind-up, but actually it would have been right, it would have been true, where the, the Man United-Man City game, Man City-Man U game, where there's a fan wearing a Man United j- jersey in the first half oh, and a Man true. City jersey in the second half. I mean, <laughs> so half and half scarves are bad enough, but I, I just cannot comprehend uh, that. That, that, isn't, that isn't football. That isn't even no. football to me, John. No. So had you been a footballer in the 1980s, John, and being <laughs> interviewed by Match or uh, Shoot and they asked you, who's your favourite second team? You, very much like Peter Grant, Paul McStay and Tommy Bonds would have replied, Celtic Reserves, I am sure. Um, <laughs> and by the way, fair play to you because Lawrence Conley is exactly the same. Um, Joe Hamilton, <laughs> it's going to be tough. Yeah, it is, Joe. But maybe we'll start clicking up front and get the goals we should have got in the first two games. And that goes back to your opening um, comments, John, where you're, we're talking about, yeah, if they click and we don't, we're in trouble. But, you know, the same thing can happen. Celtic do have the talent. And you were also talking about the transfer windows. I was reading this morning a couple of their players um, are wanted by Chelsea to the tune of a combined fee of 100 million quid. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it looks as though whenever any club assembles a group of players in European football... If you're not regarded as one of the elite clubs in one of the top six six leagues, then you're fair game because yeah. a rich a richer club will come along <coughs> and take away your best players. I mean, where will Mudrick? Where, where will he end up? You know, in the next two or three years, John. For well, example, uh, going back, going back with, with Mudrick, I'm amazed he hasn't gone already. Mm. Uh, absolutely amazed he hasn't gone already. Uh, and everyone who listens to this on a Wednesday will know how much I've been banging on about this. But I shacked that up basically a one man team. So you know, I, I'm amazed he hasn't gone already. In terms of the two boys that um, you're talking about potentially wind up for Chelsea to, for fifty four point three, and then I think forty six points on. Um, you know, you're talking about Nkunku uh, and then Guardiola, the, the young centre half. Now, um, therein lies the dichotomy for tonight, right? Because Nkunku looks a fabulous player, but he hadn't scored for five games. Mm. You know, before the weekend, it'd been five games without a, a goal. And he scored two at the weekend, um, but one of those was a penalty, and he also missed a penalty. Um, so uh, and he scored another very good goal on the break, the kind of thing that really makes me nervous. But he hadn't scored for five games before that. Timo Werner's come back. They both play in essentially the same position, so they're tripping over each other. Uh, they seem to do all right against Bochum, but again, that's the bottom team in the league, so that doesn't mean anything. Um, and they have solid players, um, you know, uh, a few of whom who will be wanted or who, you know, are very much sought after. Uh, they have some very solid players, but they have guys aren't playing well. They've got a problem mm. at fullback. Um, they're not, not particularly uh, playing well in defensively or in the middle of the park. Um, so there's plenty there for us to exploit. Um, you know, they are very close to us. I mean, he's he's almost certainly going to set up in a 4-3-3. Three, three, right. Right. So he's going to set up essentially the same as we do. So it is going to be, you know, we're going to be going toe to toe with these guys because Ange isn't going to, Ange isn't going to back down or play defensively. Although that does remind me of one thing that, you know, you think the players don't really notice this thing, but there was a point after eighty minutes against Motherwell. I distinctly remember Callum McGregor bombing forward and Jota refusing the run. He just refused point blank to go on and pass them. He, he deliberately held back, made McGregor pass it back to him. It's just mm-hmm. like, let's just calm down here and take the win. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, the, the players are well aware of the importance of this as well. But 
there are going to be, we are going to have, and this is why I'm really hoping Kyogo finds his shooting boots tonight, we are going to have chances. Yeah. And there's, a, there's a very strong possibility this just boils down to who takes our chances because we are going to give them up and we are going to get them. So it, it just boils down to who takes our chances. Um, and, you know, there are issues, uh, you know, the, 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 defensively as well for them so you know we're not the only ones with that issue so uh, I, I'm you know again I just don't know how it's going to go because we, our guys really need to show up tonight they really need to show up guys need to stand tall who have been quiet for the last few weeks so uh, we really need them show up with uh, the, the uh, playing at their, their peak tonight uh, because this game is very very important yeah, no, you're you're right. We're going to talk about some of the individuals who, in order for us to get a result, a positive result tonight, you really are looking for them to step up. You're looking for them to to get back to the the kind of form that we know they are uh, they are capable of. Michael Ross, yes, Carter Vickers is a huge loss, absolutely at this level, uh, even domestically, massive loss for Celtic. We'll be having a wee look at the central uh, central defensive partnership, um, and we'll be asking the question: How are they going to do tonight? Alan Robertson with a draw away from home being a good result I agree especially as we have our two best centre backs out injured actually Alan I would have I would have uh, as I say looked at the Ronnie um, games and thought that an away result against uh, Leipzig would have been great in any case the fact that we've got two centre backs out makes it even better is anybody <coughs> else thinking about a double pivot in the midfield or even a back three with Abield guard um, well let's talk about that because I, I wouldn't expect I may be wrong, Alan, but I wouldn't expect Abelgard to play this game. We spoke about him perhaps playing the Mullerwell game, JP and I. JP didn't think he, he would, and it was proven right. Um, if there's going to be a shock, and we know Ange has done it in the past, if there's going to be a shock in the starting lineup, I think the shock's Haksabanovic. Don't know where he'll play him, but I think if, if somebody's going to start unexpectedly, it would be Haksabanovic rather than Abelgard, John. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I would agree with that. He's already done it once. <clears throat> so we start Haksabanovic on the left, uh, put Jota on the right, and um, you know uh, play Kyogo through the middle. Now I I, I don't like that myself because Haksabanovic looks to be uh, a very very good player, but Jota I think is much better on the left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Um, I know Maeda isn't clinical, uh, uh, at, well certainly not at the moment, uh, but. You know, he does provide more sort of defensive cover. Um, you know, there are... Um, the, 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 every time we think of, like, a, a, a double pivot or something like that, what Ange has done is he's picked individual players to, put, uh, to, to fit in the system. He hasn't changed the system, right? So, uh, you know, when you start thinking about double pivot, all the rest of it, yeah, it's an interesting talking point, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. He's not going to do it. You know, he'll play his best team as he sees it, and that means uh, fitting uh, the fittest and uh, most on-form bodies into the system as he likes to play it. He's not going to change the system, uh, you know, not in my view anyway, uh, and we've never been wrong about that. He has, you know, changed the system once we're 3-0 up, or, you know, you know that sort of thing. He can, he's brought on some more defensively-minded midfielders, which is fine. Uh, but that's not how he... I don't think he'll go out to play the game that way at all. Uh, and nor would I in this case, uh, because I think our best chance of beating them is to attack them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think if we set up defensively, uh, we're, we're going to win this game. I think we have to take them on toe-to-toe, -to -toe, uh, and uh, I, I think we have enough uh, to score. I don't think we have enough to stop them scoring. That's why I don't think we should set up defensively because I think they're going to score anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, who takes our chances and who gets the most. I mean, this could be 3-1 either way or it could be a 2 all draw, you know, in my view. Um, so I fully expect them to score against us. Um, you know, coming come on to the, the sort of centre-half pairing, uh, I have like a, an emotional investment in Stephen Welsh in as much as that was the last thing my dad saw before he, he fell into unconsciousness and died the next day was uh, Stephen Welsh scoring the goal. So if you're if anyone feels like you're after Welsh, you're going to have to come come after him with more than that's how I feel about it uh, because I'll defend them to the hilt. Uh, but essentially, um, 
And this has gone back to, and I noticed that you retweeted something I tweeted at the weekend. I was watching that game with Motherwell and I was taking notes through it. So I was paying attention, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because I, I have to come on here and I have to know what I'm talking about because my memory sucks. And if I don't take notes, I don't know. So um, I had Stephen Welsh down for one mistake, uh, a, a ball that he passed uh, and was intercepted, and then, then he had to take the ball, boy down, uh, got a booking against him. That's mm-hmm. what I had him down for. As I understand it, his passing to st- the statistics were far superior to anyone else's. Uh, I, I think a lot of that frustration comes from the fact that if you find your uh, two centre-halves are distributing, uh, they're trying to make creative passes, they're trying to break things down, that's because you know there's a team that's dug in we haven't been able to draw them onto us. We can't play out and, and beat the press. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we'd be hoping tonight is is the opposite of that, um, because that's how Munch and Gladbach uh, beat them 3-0 quite handy. They beat the press. They let them press, uh, and the count, you know, they, they, they beat that press, and uh, they beat them handy. Uh, so we have to be looking for that tonight. We have to be skillful. We have to be accurate. We have to you know play with pace, power, and purpose. Um, uh, and you know we have to be incisive, and I think we can be all those things because if we, especially if we get ahead early tonight, I think we can be all those things. We need our confidence up, and I mm. think playing with space instead of having to beat down the doors of teams that have dug in uh, is far more appealing to our players. I think that's the stage that they want to be be on. They want to be comparing their skills like for like with other people who are attacking. So, you know, it could be a tremendous game tonight. And, I, you know, I certainly hope we come out on top. But, you know, again, um, I think our best form of defence is attack. Listen, I, there's quite a few points there um, that we'll expand on, John, because on the subject of Welsh, um, there was some criticism on particularly the Facebook uh, Axon page around the post-match discussion uh, after the Motherwell game. I am a fan of Stephen Welsh, and I think that goes back to um, when he's breaking into the team, speaking to someone who had watched him progress through the kind of youth ranks, John. Uh, and he says to me that in terms of his passing ability, his distribution was excellent. Um, and he was a player that was kind of head and shoulders. And I think when you look at the underaged progression that he's had at international level, the fact he's a captain of the side, there's no doubt about that. But I, w- I would also throw in the fact that we have had two bids for, for Welsh. Now, I don't know if, if one of them is permanent and one of them is a loan deal from Udinese and Toulouse. So he's coming up on the radars, John, of clubs around Europe. Um, and my take on this, and I would love for Alan Morrison to have a um, a discussion about this at some point as well, is that these teams who really are investing a lot in the data um, are realising from the stats and from the figures that this kid at Celtic, because he is still young, um, is coming up with brilliant stats on a consistent basis. So the eye test that is mentioned time and time again I sometimes think can be swayed by a perception of the individual. So it goes back to this bias that you might have against or for certain players. Some people say to me on on the, the YouTube channel, for example, that I never criticise Kyogo or Juranovic. Now, we all have biases. This is a thing, John. So I'm not going to sit here and deny that I've got them, because we all do. Um, but I think that sometimes it goes back to the players coming through the ranks where they seem to get a, a harder time They've got to work that wee bit harder to win us over at times. Do you think Stephen Welsh suffers a bit from that? Of course he does. Absolutely he does, as does Anthony Ralston. Uh, you know, uh, and it used to drive me nuts. Uh, you know, Ralston would go out and have like a, a, a tremendous game and you'd still got people absolutely slating him. And I mean, not just even related to the game, just, oh, he's, not, he's never good enough to be a player. You know, never mind how he played in the game. You, you've got that with Ralston. Even when he was playing well, we've now uh, got it with Welsh. Do they have to overcome uh, that bias? I think they do. There's confirmation bias. Uh, and Welsh, you know, did suffer from it from the weekend. You could see um, the, the crowd were getting restless, you know. And, you know, it was pointed out, it was in fact Alan, Alan Morrison that pointed it out, that... Uh, you're about 33 minutes in or something, and he misplaced a pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the first pass he'd misplaced 
all for the for the whole game, uh, and the crowd was all oh, just groaning and booing, and you know, um, yeah. Uh, so, welcome to the world of Loteria. Experience the game like never before. The cello, the parrot, the drum, the hand. Vive la Loteria. Play in a new world with new chances to win up to $60,000 with the Loteria Scratch-Off game from the New York Lottery. You must be 18 years or older to purchase a lottery ticket. Please play responsibly. Introducing the Planet Fitness Guide to getting that post-workout glow. Step 1. What's your why? More epic energy? Better sleep? Blow off steam? Step 2. Join Planet Fitness for $1 down, $10 a month, cancel any time, and get moving. Go cardio crazy in our clean and spacious clubs, or get down with some dumbbells and strength equipment. Step 3. Bask in that post-workout glow. Join Planet Fitness today for $1 down, $10 a month, cancel any time. Deal ends Friday, October 14th. It's glow time. See club for details. It is very much confirmation bias. You're looking for mistakes from these guys. We're looking for mistakes from the ends. Now, I covered this uh, again in the St Mirren game. We're talking about, and uh, you know, our friends, I, I will acknowledge the fact that uh, the one thing Stephen Welsh isn't great at is winning aerial duels. He's not a big guy, so he doesn't win aerial duels uh, against other big people. Thankfully, that's not going to be a concern tonight, but he doesn't win those duels. So I can understand why people think he's getting bullied around the place. But he hasn't given away any goals as a result of that. Not that I can see. I, the, the mistake that he made for the goal against St Mirren was nothing to do with being, you know, uh, you know, not winning a duel or, uh, you know, being dominated by someone. Basically had a grip of the guy and then took a step forward and uh, fell over and the boy just headed it in. So it was a mistake from Stephen, but um, it wasn't because he was being dominated. Uh, and in terms of his distribution, he was far and away our best passer by some distance against Mother, mm-hmm. by some distance. Um, so you know, I, I, you know, think of the, the pressure of that as well. You, you're your centre halves at that point because we are pushed so far up and they're so deep. They're not just being asked to make the usual, you know, four or five yard passes to the midfield. You're being asked to do something creative. Mm-hmm. You've been asked to sort of ping balls around the place. Are you going to make mistakes doing that? Yeah, because, you know, if you were good enough to do that, you'd be playing in the midfield. You know, that's the problem. So, you know, yeah, the, the, when you're asking us, when our centre-halves are pushed so far up, we never play well. You know, we very rarely play well like that because you, you're asking too much of them and there's not enough space. Um, you know, I, and Jens, I'd be, you know, in terms of tonight... Uh, just jumping back onto that. In terms of tonight, I'd be more concerned about Jens because he he doesn't turn quickly. He doesn't have the recovery pace. So I'd be be far more concerned about that tonight. Uh, You know, we're not going to be worried about aerial duels tonight. That's not uh, where they're going to be scoring from. They're going to be on the counter-attack and there's going to be balls over the top. So, yeah, retreating quickly and also your your positional awareness are going to be absolutely crucial. Um, You know, are, you know, obviously uh, losing our first choice centre halves is a blow, um, but with the kind of game that we're going to have tonight, they wouldn't necessarily expose the weaknesses that these players have. Uh, it depends on uh, how the, the the system is set up uh, and how deep we're going to play them. Um, but it could be, I mean, you know, the but the thing is, they're just as easy beat with a ball over the top. You know, because I was watching them as well, so they are just as easy beat with a ball over the top. Uh, and in fact, when you're looking at, if you get them on the counter attack, at one point against Dortmund, they were playing with a two-two base and six up front. So they had the two centre halves, uh, the the two defensive midfielders, they had their four uh, forward players in a very very tight group in the middle. So that brought in the entire defence, and their full backs were completely unmarked, you know, mm. miles out on the touch lines. So that's a very interesting philosophy, but if you get caught on the counter there, you know you're you're, you're really struggling. Um, so, I, I you know look, we're all disappointed about CCV and all the rest of it, but you know as I say tonight, if 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 Stephen uh, and Maurice Jens, uh, if they can uh, basically hold their ground and not make any mistakes, and that's a big thing, if they just don't make any obvious errors. Um, then I don't think that's going to be the issue. I don't think they are going to be the issue. Um, 
you know. And if anything, you're looking down that side. I mean, they've got pace all over the park this lot. So, you mm. know, Greg Taylor could struggle. Uh, you know, they, they've got a litany of front players uh, who are very, very, very good. Uh, and, um, you know, so Greg Taylor could struggle as he did, you know, um, uh, b- before against Bodo Glimt with, with, you know, the people with, who are very, very quick, just with mm. space behind running past them. Um, but, you know, again, he's been one of our better players all year, so you'd hope that doesn't happen. Look, if you're looking for problems, there are problems all over the park, right? So Absolutely. We, we, we have to be, we have to try and be positive and, you know, think that, you know, these guys, our guys will play at the top of their game because there are problems all over the park, mm. you know, uh, you know, O'Reilly's not in particularly great form. The, the, the forwards, you know, aren't playing particularly well for the most part. Um, but the thing about it is, we know they can. Mm. We know they can. So I suppose if you're going to be a supporter, uh, you know, rather than just be an analyst, if you're going to be a supporter, you have to say, you know, let's just, you know, try and get behind that point. <laughs> you know, we can do this. We can. Mm. It's whether we will. Yeah, so, you know, but at least we can, Paul, at least we can. So we're not up against, you know, the Paris Saint-Germain's and the, you know, some of the hideous groups we've had in the past. We are just getting out there waiting to get absolutely pumped. We can win this game. We can get a positive result. Yeah, um, you're right. So, you know, uh, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to stick on that positive point. <laughs> Listen, I'm all for positivity and yeah. you'll see that at the end of the show when I give you my prediction for the result tonight. I'm going to be really <laughs> positive. Um, but on the point that you made there where there are areas that can be uh, manipulated by both teams this evening, I, I thought it was very interesting. And I mentioned this on Monday, the, the comments that uh, Chris Julian made in relation to Ange Postacoglu's approach to identifying these weaknesses, John, and then homing in on them. He said it's like a game of chess to Ange, uh, using video analysis, etc. So if there are um, any kind of weak areas within that, uh, within the ranks of our opponents this evening, then I'm pretty sure Ange is aware of them. The Celtic players will also be aware of them. And I'm going to break off for a moment because, as I said at the top of the show, a hundred years since Jock Steen was born. And I want to talk a wee bit about that. And about it's going to lead into... What next for Celtic? And I think, uh, you know, this is one just to debate, John. Um, Jay McKelvey really think tonight will be a struggle with Welsh and Jens at the back, unfortunately. I'm going to go back. Last word on the central defence, right? I'm going to go back to Ibrox earlier this year. And it was a game that we played last season um, in April, whereby we had absolutely uh, destroyed them in the February at Celtic Park, John. The only thing, the only disappointment that night, we we didn't score more than we did. Um, and then we play them at Ibrox and uh, they took a very early read, you'll remember uh, Aaron Ramsey scored the goal, mm-hmm. but uh, Celtic's defensive performance in the 2-1 win was resolute and I remember going up to that game and if you were to check the Axon bulletins leading up to that game, there was criticism about the Celtic defence leading into that game and the two centre-halves were Cameron Carter-Vickers and Carl Staffelt, who are clearly the first choice centre-halves but now mm-hmm. We're talking about the backups and Cameron Carter Vickers and Starfelt are untouchable. Listen, they have a great p- partnership, but leading up to that game, they were under criticism. The Celtic defence was being criticised. And they had a performance that day where we were under the cosh for a fair bit of that game, John. And the defence, the defensive display was outstanding. Probably one of the best defensive displays by Celtic that season. The point that I'm um, the reason I'm bringing it up is we had concerns going into that game at Ibrox in April about the defence. We've got concerns tonight, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have, but it's at times like this that they can rise to the occasion. And that is what I'm looking at tonight. That's as positive as I'm going to be tonight about the defence. I think Joe Hart can play a big part in that. He's got loads of Champions League experience, John. He'll play a big part in it. I think Juranovic, who came in for a lot of flack after the Motherwell game, will play a part in it. Taylor has been excellent all season. Get back to that form, and then you know that kind of like that osmosis almost that permeates but right right through the actual team. Uh, so as a defensive unit, you know I, I'm looking for a big display tonight, and I'm hoping that we're going to get it. Well, I mean, I I, I thought that's how we were going to start out on in the, the Motherwell game. I mean, my first page of notes says uh, Welsh excellent pass, Welsh excellent pass, Welsh very strong challenge. 
you know, he nearly kicked the boy six feet in the air at a legit challenge in the first mm-hmm. half, make, trying to make a point. And if you do that in one of these games, you know, uh, the, the crowd should just go mad. So, you know, that would be fantastic if we're going to make a point. Joe Hart needs to, again, he's another guy who needs to stand up tonight because, mm-hmm. you know, one point there, you know, and that is certainly uh, in the Motherwell game, it's like he, he liked the line more than uh, Robbie Fowler and he was walking up like Johnny Cash, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he, it's just the absolute refusal to come off his line. Now, he did come off his line a few times in, 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 the, in the, the second half, but only when there's no bodies in front of him. Whenever yeah. there's bodies in front of him, you know, he just won't commit uh, to going for anything. Um, so that concerns me normally. I don't think that's going to be an issue tonight because what we're going to see tonight uh, in terms of chances is more like the kind of chance that Madrid took against us. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's going to be a clean breakthrough um, and Joe Hart's going to have to have the game of his life try to stop them. Uh, so we need the centre-halves to be tremendous tonight. We need Joe Hart to be absolutely tremendous tonight. And if the, the, the rest of the boys are firing, there's a lot of ifs. <laughs> there's an awful lot of ifs. Um, but again, it's so difficult to say because we just don't know you know, who's going to turn up tonight? What what's, what team's going to turn up? Because if we turn up and play well, we can absolutely pummel them and vice versa. So I, I just don't know. Um, you know, my, my sort of logical head is struggling to put a, a result on it because there's no forum to speak of getting into this. Uh, which could really let you know one way or another. My supporter said it's a completely different thing. <laughs> I'm quite clear on, on what we should be doing. Um, but look, you know, it's... Um, it's exciting, um, uh, but very, very anxious. Um, uh, you know, and I, I'm not even looking at the comments just now because, again, I'm too anxious to be looking at other people being anxious. So. Yeah, <laughs> yep. it spreads. The anxiety <laughs> will spread. It breeds. Um, yeah. Talking of which, I mean, Jockstein, as, as I've said a couple of times, yeah, yeah 100 years since he was born and um, born on this day. I'm going to, to go through a a few things in relation to this because it does lead us on to where Celtic are right now. Why do we have aspirations? Why are we a club renowned around Europe? Well, it was Jockstein and the team that he built that gave us these aspirations. And I always go back to that. I mentioned earlier on Celtic uh, reached the semi-final of the 1964 European Cup Winners' Cup, MTK Budapest, and we should have gone through. I mean, look it up if you're a wee bit younger, but after the first leg, we should certainly have got through to the final. And then we came close again a couple of years later against Liverpool. But the the 12 years, say that a million times, you'll be thinking that I'm banging the same drum. That 12-year period from 64 to 76, Celtic got to at least a quarter-final of European competition on nine occasions. That That is astonishing, right? So people who maybe look at the record books and say, well, you know, you only had to win nine games to win the European Cup or any of this nonsense. Celtic at that point were as close to being a European superpower as the likes of Ajax became in the 1970s. Um, and when you look at Jockstein and, and what he did at Celtic, it was really astonishing. And the words that stood out for me this week, John, from Ange Postacoglu, he's good when it comes to words. I'm standing on his shoulders, not following in his footsteps. Uh, and we've, we've spoken long and hard about Ange Postacoglu and how he got loads of inspiration from French uh, Puskas, who was his manager at South Melbourne, Hellas from 89 to 92. But we've got to go further back than that. We've got to go back to the 1940s and, and a guy called Jimmy Hogan. Now, when you think of the great Hungarian side of the 1950s. They were managed by Gustav Sebes. I hope I got that pronunciation right. Uh, I think I got the Leipzig one right. Um, He was the manager of the Hungary side who beat England 6-3. Now, in that side, of course, was Ferenc Puskas, who scored a couple of goals. The, The tape of that game was said to be worn out by Jock Steen. Why why Jock Steen loved the Hungarian side? Well, it was down to that game and the fact that he watched them play in the 1954 World Cup. And the reason he watched them play in the 54 World Cup is because Celtic had won the double, 53-54, and the board treated the players to go to the World Cup, John. 
and a few Celtic players were representing Scotland at the World Cup. Nearly mocking included. The rest of them sat in the stands and probably twiddled their thumbs, but no Jock Steen. He was like you against Motherwell. He was taking notes. And he fell in love with Hungary. He fell in love with that side. And that side were hugely influenced by an Englishman called Jimmy Hogan. And I'm going to read it another quote. This comes from the manager of that 1954 Hungarian side who beat England in 1953 at Wembley 6-3. They got to the final with the World Cup in 54. And Sebe says of Jimmy Hogan, we played football as Jimmy Hogan taught us. Jimmy Hogan, of course, comes to Celtic Park in 1948 and was an influence in Jockstein who later arrived in 1951. Jockstein already had um, been watching this Hungarian side um, in, in later years and became obsessed with him, if you believe Archie McPherson and the excellent biography that he wrote of Jockstein. So what we've got there is connections to Jockstein and Jimmy Hogan and Hungarian football and Ferenc Puskas. Fast forward to the late 80s and Puskas goes over to Melbourne and he meets a guy called Ange Postacoglu and he plays a massive part in Angie's formation of a strategy, John. And so the Jockstein spirit, the Jimmy Hogan spirit, lives on to this day through our current gaffer. And, and he's spoken long and hard about Ferenc Puskas and the inspiration and, and the influence of that man um, in his philosophy. Now, part of the philosophy of Jock, as you know, is to rear your own players into a strategy, into a formation that you don't change. You play your way. I think the only game that he ever came into for criticism for playing defensively was away against Dukla Prague just to get through the tie, where it was nothing each, and he played one up front with Stevie Chalmers. So my question to you, John, right, is, and it's maybe a, a, a kind of sweeping generalisation, should Celtic look at going back to a scenario where we are basically rearing our own footballers? And are we doing that enough? Because at the moment, as you say, we're on the, the first rung of the Champions League ladder here in a new era under Ange Postecoglou. Will it work? Will it not work? Who knows? Financially, our strategy has worked in terms of recruitment, buying them in relatively cheaply, selling them on at a profit. But can we do more in the old kind of school way that Jock Steen did it, bringing players through for the success of Celtic Football Club? Well, you, you would hope so. Uh, but I, I had a look back. If you go back on the last... I tried to keep it within about 20 years. Um, so, you know, let's say from 2000-ish uh, onwards. Uh, I just had a look at all the academy players who have contributed anything at all, really, to the, the, the first team. Um, and in that period, which is now 22 years, uh, there have been 28 players. Uh, those 28 players... Uh, we've had transfers of 42.565 million. Uh, now, obviously, a good chunk of that was uh, Tierney. Mm -hmm. uh, so without Tierney, it's 18.265. But anyway, uh, so 28 players at 42.565. And there is currently uh, in the squad academy players worth uh, 19.25 million. Um, so in total, you're looking at over the last sort of 20 odd years, generated 61.82 million in transfers and value. Plus, you've got another sort of eight players there that gave us two and a half years' service each on average. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's not accounted for in any of those figures. So, you would say the, the academy as it stands is costing three million a year to run. You know, I don't know what it was costing. Uh, 20 years ago, but what I would say is we'll be lucky if we've broken even there or at least it'll be very, very close to breaking even. Um, so in terms of, and that's with one generational size transfer, which, you know, yeah. I, I, again, we didn't see that in the previous 20 years or the 20 years before that, to be fair. Uh, so that's a huge transfer in there and we've just broken even. And the list of names, I have to tell you, uh, you know, there's some good players, but it's, you know, of those 28 players, you know, it's a pretty meh list. You know, it's a, it's not complete. It's not an inspirational list. Um, so you know, but there, there's been, you know, obviously Kieran Tierney and you know mm -hmm. people like that. So you know, but apart from that, you know, James Forrest is still around. You're talking about Stephen McManus and Callum McGregor, and you know. 
but you're also talking about likes of Killian Sheridan and you know uh, Don McGeerk and uh, you know James McCarthy still counts. Um, Darnell Fisher apparently counts uh, if you remember him. Um, Josh Thompson, you know people like that. You know Philip Twardzik. Um, even Karamoko Dembele technically had a, had at least one appearance. So, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, the, the, you know these are included in that twenty, and they, their contribution to the first team is very minimal. As are at least half the names on that list. You're talking about minimal contributions. Um, so, uh, do we have to do something different? Yes, and I would say uh, that we have to start with. I don't understand the, the current setup. Why? Are, why have we got a team? in the fifth tier, what is the Lowland League going to teach anybody? You know, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand what we hope to achieve. Are we seriously saying these guys are going to make that step up? Would we sign someone from that league? No, so you, if wouldn't, we, you, uh, you, if, you wouldn't go near you know, a player. Yeah. yeah. No, if, we, if, so if our boys are playing them and they get schooled by a couple of guys in that league, are we going to sign the guys that schooled them? You know, you wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. You know, it's for me. I, I don't understand what we're trying to achieve. You know, there is far too big. You know, I, and I know that the reserve leagues had to be abandoned back in the day because there wasn't a lot of money knocking about. But I, I, could we not? Can we not re-establish a reserve league now? I mean, there's enough money, surely, to you know, and the squads are big enough now, and the game's professional enough now, where we could do that. That's fair enough in the 1980s, where there was there was no money knocking about, and it was everyone was struggling, but. You know the game. There's enough money in the game now. I think to have a reserve league. I don't understand why we don't. Um, you know, cause I, for the life of me, I cannot see the point in this. Can't see the point in it. But what are we trying to do with those young fellas? You know, and that B squad to me is completely pointless. Uh, and you know, so starting from there and working downwards. You know, because that that's the, the sort of elite level of the academy. Mm-hmm. So there's an intermediate level and a junior level. So that's the elite level of the academy. And your elite, what we're basically saying is our elite level is Lowland League standard. You know, I I don't understand. And you know, we want we want those players as we did last season. We want those players to sit on the bench as part of a, a European squad, John. <coughs> so how well prepared are we going to be if that's the level they're playing at? Oh my god! You know, you know, it's, it'll be slaughter. You know, uh, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. Um, and the other thing as well, how can you possibly tell if they're good enough, you know, playing in that environment? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how uh, you know what, what do the coaching staff learn from that? I'd be amazed if uh, you know, if you can show me another league where there's a similar setup anywhere in Europe, I'd be astonished. You know? I think that um, you, you were talking about the reserve league, something that comes up all the time when you speak to ex players. Uh, we will be talking to ex-player Brian McClare in January, by the way, shameless plug, but the, the gig is sold out at this moment in time. Um, we will be returning to Gracie's in February. And yesterday, if you were hanging about Heart Hill Services, you would have seen me talking to another Celtic legend, John. I don't know how many of you are hanging about Heart Hill Services, but it looked all a bit dodgy. Meeting, meeting in the middle of that... Um, uh, yeah. is it, what is it an overpass or an overhang um, in any case if you want to get a, a ticket guarantee your ticket for that go to the link underneath this video add your name your email address rather and you will hear first when the tickets become available but whenever you talk to these guys even players that played in the 80s and the 90s when there was a reserve league they always bemoan the absence of that competitive bridge between youth player and first team and like you say there in terms of the money there is also money that is allocated to each team um, and it should be ring fenced for youth Football. It should be ring fenced for academy football. I think in the past that has been abused, and player and teams have gone out and bought players with the money. Uh, but if that was ring fenced and then obviously fed into a reserve system, uh, I think that what you would find um, is the development of players would be vastly improved. Sometimes, John, all you need to do is play alongside or against somebody who's a wily old um, cat who's maybe coming back from injury, who's maybe out of favour, fell out with the gaffer, coming back, etc. And, you know, playing alongside them in the cent- central defence, I remember some of the young Celtic players like Stuart Balmer telling me that the education he got playing for the reserves alongside Tom McAdam was better than any textbook or any coaching that he ever, ever received. Just, you know, yeah. actually going out there and doing it and learning from a guy who was an old head. 
But yeah, I mean, if, but the, the the gap is so big. We were given Christopher Julian uh, a bit of abuse because of his attitude mm-hmm. when he had to go and play in the B team. But it is an insult. It's an insult to ask that guy to play at that level. You know, if you were him, you know, and I know people are going to be saying, "Oh no, he wants to play for Celtic at any level." But that guy, you know, you're talking about an eight million pound player, and yes, he's coming back from injury. But he's, he's, he's playing with wee boys and he's playing with wee boys against other wee boys, you know, or against hammer throwers who are going to break his legs if they get the chance. So, you know, I, I, again, there's no use to us, there's no value to us in rehabbing our own first team players. There's no value to the academy players in playing at that level. Uh, I, I just, I, I fail to see or I fail to be convinced uh, by any argument as to why this is a setup, I think we need to start restart that structure immediately uh, and try and find. A, a, you know, but the problem is you need the, the agreement of all these other clubs as well. So it's not yeah. just as easy as that. Mm-hmm. You know, but from our point of view, we can't have the end point of the elite academy being the lowland league. We can't have that. You know, and also, you know, what, what is? But there, you know, there's really no path. Mm-hmm. There is no path. Because what you're going to do, you're going from the Lowland League and then you're going to start training with a first team squad, but you're not going to play. You know, you're not going to, you know, and what, how many games, and we've seen this season alone, yeah, there's too much at stake now. There's Champions League qualification at stake. You're not going to be getting runouts um, there uh, for someone who has made that much of a jump. It's a huge jump. If you make that jump, you know, up five leagues or whatever it is, uh, and suddenly come into Celtic's first team mm-hmm. uh, and play in a game where, um, you know, we have to win, as we do with all these games. I just don't see how that ever happens. It's not a path for these boys. So even the good ones, you're going to lose them. You're going to ultimately lose them uh, because they'll go and find another path. Uh, so I, I just don't see how it's out that way. And we need to be so much better at it. Our academy has not produced uh, over the years. Uh, as I say, we're lucky if we've broken even. Uh, you know, so I, I think we need to do much better. But you would hope, Paul, that this is part of the structures that uh, are, are coming in now. We want to have mm. a proper, uh, uh, you know, football department, and that's part of it. So it's not always done in a wing and a prayer and based on you know what the last guy did for five minutes. You know, so uh, we we need to have far better structures. They need to be far more reliable, and you know, it's. We can't always have, as I say, as I said before on this show, Ange came in and did some unbelievable business for us, picking up, you know, players for peanuts. That's not mm-hmm. going to happen again. That, that's very, very unlikely to happen again. So, where are we always going to rely on like, really unbelievable scouting? You know, because we have to be so much better and so much more tuned in than everyone else. Because if we can't rely on bringing our own through, that's going to be a problem going forward. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and it's, it's been a problem in the past already, but, you know, uh, w- w- it's very unlikely we can carry on as we have with uh, the, the scouting level that we have. We're bringing in, you know, essentially five million pound players for a million and a half. Uh, so that that's not going to continue. So we have to have a legacy structure. We have to have something there which will continue in the years to come. Um, so, uh, you know, and it's, you know, again, as I said this last week, it's a generational club. You, you mm-hmm. know, you want your own, your own children to follow it. So there's no point in saying, oh, you know, oh, it's too difficult to do it now. It has to be done. It has to be done. It has to be dealt with. You know, otherwise, the same conversation happens 20 years from now. Exactly. Exactly. There's a couple of things that you've mentioned. Uh, first of all, I remember on this show, Chris Julian getting a wee bit of stick for the, the attitude that you were talking about. But you've got to remember, this is a guy who was part of an under-20 World Cup squad for France who won the World Cup. And, you know, fast forward 10 years and he's playing against the same age of guys he was playing 10 years ago. So yeah. I, I can understand why a player at that level would find it difficult to motivate himself. The argument... I think at the time was he's wearing the Celtic jersey, he needs to try, he can be a great inspiration to the young kids he's playing with. I get that as well. Talking of which, Celtic's um, B team are playing Leipzig today as they do in the afternoon of the Champions League and they're winning 2-1. Uh, Rocco Vata opened the scoring. Um, who I, think... I take all that back, Paul. I take all that back. <laughs> it's a fantastic structure. <laughs> and uh, I've got to say, he is the one um, he's the player that you know. I, I'm I'm sure will have a lot of attention. Uh, we have already 
got potentially a lost generation of child talent. Nobody knows how well they're going to do all these young kids who have left for various clubs all over Europe. Um, however, we need to keep Rocco Vata, that's for sure. Um, one final thing before we go, John. Prediction. Tonight, how's it going to go? Uh, I I will take a 2 all draw, uh, but uh, with my supporters' head on, we're going to beat them 3-1. Right, brilliant. I would also take a 2-2, but we're going to beat them 3-2. There we mm. go. Positivity <laughs> reigns at Celtic State of Mind. Why um, not? Don't believe the hype. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. John, my first appearance on the show with you has been utterly enjoyable. That was a very quick hour. Thank you very much for everybody getting involved. Thank you to John Hughes for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Introducing the Planet Fitness Guide to getting that post-workout glow. Step one, what's your why? More epic energy, better sleep, blow off steam? Step two, join Planet Fitness for $1 down, $10 a month, cancel any time, and get moving. Go cardio crazy in our clean and spacious clubs, or get down with some dumbbells and strength equipment. Step three, bask in that post-workout glow. Join Planet Fitness today for $1 down, $10 a month, cancel any time. Deal ends Friday, October 14th. It's glow time. See club for details.